Hello, welcome back to Father Offspring Interviews. This is episode 19. We are going to jump right in today with our first question. You ready? Sure. You ready, Safi? <laughs> Sure. Okay. Yes. So, um, Aziz from India says, It has been commonly known that fears of snakes and spiders are innate, but some studies suggest that newborns don't react fearfully to them. So, which is it? Well, kind of both, but a different version of innate than we often think. Okay, we've got phobias. We've got stuff that are in contrast to just generalized anxiety disorders, generalized social anxiety, a very specific fear. And one that is resistant to trying to extinguish, one that is resistant to, say, you give somebody a benzodiazepine, a tranquilizer, and it doesn't have much of an effect. It is in their hardcore. And in people, sort of the three traditional phobias are dangling over a huge empty space yawning below you, spiders and snakes. And when making sense of that, right off the bat, it's clear we're incredibly attuned to them. You look at a picture, big crowded one, and there's a picture of a spider in there or a picture of a tiny little bird or something, and we're much better at spotting the spider. We are all set to see spiders and snakes, and we understand what this is about on at least two levels. One is an evolutionary one. You know, we have been selected to be cautious about spiders and snakes in a way that we have not been selected to be terrified of golden retrievers. And that makes a certain amount of sense. When you look at it closely, though, there's some problems with that theory. Okay, we also have a sense of how that works, phobias, on sort of a neurobiological level. It's this part of the brain, the amygdala, fear, anxiety. There's all these different subparts to the amygdala, with two famous ones being the central amygdala, which is in the center of the amygdala, and something called the basal lateral amygdala. You're learning to be afraid of something, to be afraid of a type of people you've never encountered before. All of that you're acquiring a fear. That's the basal lateral amygdala, which has some similarities to kind of a primitive cortex. And it learns to be afraid of something. It tells the central nucleus of the amygdala, which then tells the rest of the body. The central part of the amygdala is the one that doesn't have to learn what it's afraid of. That's where you get the phobias. And evolutionarily, it's a much older part of the brain. It's there in all sorts of species that don't have a, let me learn to like be scared around this or that um, with the basal lateral amygdala. Okay, so that makes sense. We know evolutionary level, we know on this neurobiological level and phobias, and it makes sense that it's spiders and snakes. And then there's a problem with it in that there's some people who are not afraid of snakes. And in fact, they love them. They collect them. They think they're amazing because they're, I don't know, they're silent, they're smooth, they're, they're graceful, they're elegant, they've got cool patterns or whatever. They are not afraid of snakes. And this is a whole subfield of people who like devote their lives to it. And even more bizarre to me, there's people who love spiders arachnologists, I don't know, whatever they're called, but people who will devote their whole career to studying spiders who not only respect them and glory in their variability, but like love them. They love having spiders around and have pet spiders and give them names and things like that. And I found out recently that in uh, the Philippines in particular, there's this phenomenon of people having spider fights that someone will have their champion spider, which they'll put up against somebody else's spider, and they'll put them on a stick where they have to go towards each other, and they start fighting, and everybody bets on them. And this is predominantly kids who do this, but some adults. And there's a kid who's holding each end of it, and the spider gets this way. They pick up the spider and put it back there, and they love their champion spiders and all of that. This is like totally nightmarish to look at YouTubes of this. 
but this is clearly an exception. And exactly as was asked in the question, uh, very young kids do not have an automatic fear of spiders and snakes. Nonetheless, there is something innate going on. And the term for it, you see in ethology, ethological term, prepared learning. We don't start off life being scared of spiders and snakes, but it's real easy for us to learn to do this. How do you show this uh, fear conditioning? You, you take somebody and you expose them to an upsetting, scary stimulus. You make a loud noise just behind them and you couple it with something completely innocuous like a rubber ball in his mouth and you begin to associate it with that. And we know amazing history of this was this was first worked out by a guy John Watson who was one of the founders of behaviorism American psychology and his famous notorious little Albert experiment where he took a small child who he terrified by unexpectedly making loud noises which he would pair beforehand with a stuffed puppy stuffy thing. And what do you know? You could condition baby Albert to be terrified of this little stuffy there. And this is the stuff of legends now. This actually occurred, but a remarkable number of misinterpretations of it. One urban myth about it is little Albert grew up to try to kill Watson for doing that to him. And that is not true. And the best evidence suggests that the man who in fact was little Albert uh, was in adulthood, according to his family, not fond of dogs. Explained that. Um, another urban myth was partially true, which was little Albert was actually Watson's child. His child, who was, and as the story goes, the child grew up terribly screwed up by this attempted suicide, obviously mythic. Uh, this one was actually kind of true. Watson had two sons, both of whom were attempted to suicide. One succeeded, and they both blamed it on his parenting style and his principles of behaviorism. And then the third urban myth is absolutely true, which is Watson ran off with his research assistant on this experiment, which was a big scandal, and he got fired from Johns Hopkins University. And instead, he went to Madison Avenue and became a very, very well-paid, successful advertising executive, understanding how people's behaviors could be changed. Okay, I digress here. So you're trying to condition a baby to something neutral, a two-year-old, something innocuous or whatever, and you see how many times do you need to associate this conditioned stimulus with the terrifying, unexpected noise behind. And what you see is our brains are prepared to yoke spiders and snakes more readily with scary stuff than with all sorts of other objects. We've got a lower threshold. So we do not innately have phobias about these things, but we have an innate predisposition, an innate vulnerability towards associating those things with scary stuff. Great. All right. Our next question is, uh, what can you say about body integrity identity disorder, formerly called opotemnophilia? Oh, I've been waiting through this whole series for somebody to ask this. And as soon as they did, I got terrified that I wouldn't be able to pronounce it right. Apotemnophilia, op apotemnophilia. This is an obscure psychiatric disorder, which is sort of mentioned in DSM, Diagnostic Statistical Manual, but it hasn't quite made it yet as an official category. This is a psychiatric disorder of people who have always thought of themselves as amputees, who is, oh, have always thought that I need to have this limb removed for me to finally feel like the person I was meant to be. This is for real. There are truly people like this. Very often it goes back to childhood where they first report this. Horrifyingly, there's like chat rooms where people with this talk to each other and give each other advice on how you can stage an industrial accident that will cost you a limb, that will make it look like an accident. Doctors who'd be willing to do this. Totally bizarre. Oh my God, what an amazing psychological disorder, which people have known about for a while as 
a psychological disorder. And predictably, like psychodynamic people got in there saying that the desire to have your limb amputated was an erotic manifestation of the hatred of your mother, which I'm not going to lie, I don't really understand how we got there. But it's also a case study of this boy who was repressed in his homosexuality. And when he was young, he saw another boy with a wooden leg and thus he wanted to lose his... And uh, so psychological theory is about half the people with this have schizophrenia, have some sort of psychosis disorder. But what's up with the other half? Well, we have a very mysterious psychological disorder here until you look in the brain. And as one of our common themes, you see there is a neurobiological basis to it. Your body identity, your sense of where you end and the outside world starts is having to do with a part of your brain called the parietal cortex. And we all have, you sit here very quietly and without moving your big toe, think about that you have a big toe. And you can feel it there. You know it's there. You could think about moving it. Don't actually do it. but you, And you can see the neurons up there that will command that to, are just beginning to fire up and the muscles are beginning to have a preparatory thing. And if you're left-handed, it's easier to feel your left-handed fingertips than to this. There's more. Your body is connected there. And what they're seeing now with a lot of people with apotemnophilia is little ischemic, little pockets of damage in the parietal cortex. So that easiest explanation, a part of their body just doesn't feel like it's a part of them. And ever since back when, this has been this weird appendage thing that they're just carrying around with them and they are never going to be truly who they are, who they were meant to be until this thing is gotten off. So it's like one of your classic 20th century stories of what started off as a psychological phenomenon, a psychopathological phenomenon. Oh, there's a brain basis of it exactly as one would expect. In some ways, sort of the inverse of phantom limb. Exactly. Um, all right. So next, uh, Daniel from Germany says, imagine you had a newborn offspring and you were forced to have it raised by non-human primates, but you're allowed to pick the species. Which species would you choose and would the answer differ by gender? Um, so many choices. One that comes to mind is mountain gorillas. My, my first love was mountain gorillas and they're, they're peaceful and they're calm and pensive and introspective and they're beautiful. But as a drawback, um, every now and then mountain gorillas murder infants in something called competitive infanticide. So that's kind of a downer. Um, there's bonobos. Bonobos who have all sorts of means of avoiding aggression and this female dominated culture and they're totally cool and all of that. Um, it's turning out though that male bonobos are not quite as unaggressive as they turn out to be. So there's some drawbacks there. Uh, gibbons. Gibbons are a possibility. They mate for life and they sing. A gibbon pair will sing. You can go like check this out on YouTube. And as you know, mommy and I are not only fans of singing, but of monogamy as well. So gibbons are a good model. Um, chimps. Chimps come to mind. I, I happen to be very, very bad with tools. So I would love for a child of mine, as opposed to you guys, to be raised by someone who like knows about tools and how to make them and, and chimps are really good at that. Um, I guess ultimately my choice would be um, a proboscis monkey, which if you don't know what they look like, go immediately go to like Google images and look at a proboscis monkey because what they will teach their children is that it's inner beauty that matters, not outer beauty. So that's what I would hope for ultimately. Okay, finally, uh, Diana from Colombia slash Germany asks, uh, could you please talk about the science paper that you commented on a few years ago about kids selecting faces of election candidates? 
oh, wonderful bridge to the difference between internal and external beauty. Um, I think we've talked about the fact that you know, we're supposedly rational creatures. We make tools, or at least some of us do. We got a big cortex, and we are rational machines of economic optimization. And no, we're all sorts of subliminal stuff and implicit stuff is going on there. And one of those realms is that we make all sorts of misattributions to people based on how attractive they are. People who are more attractive parentheses, what that often means is they have more symmetrical facial features, or they have particularly exaggerated versions of secondary sexual characteristics. People who we think of as being more attractive, we believe them more readily. We're more likely to vote for them. We're more likely to acquit them, all sorts of things like this, and all sorts of ways in which we're judging people by their appearance. And there's been these cool studies where, like you show adults, pictures of two individuals, and you say, which of them looks more competent? And they pick one of the two and go through a whole series of these. And like 70% of the time, they pick the one of a pair who won an election against the other one. There's elaborations on this. You see that with male candidates, when the economy is bad, people have a strong preference for faces of candidates that have pronounced secondary sexual male character, big jutting jaws and high forehead and well-defined features and all of that. And when it's in good economic times, there's a preference for people, the paper actually used this phrase, who have a baby face because they're viewed as being kinder and more honest. And it shifts like that. Okay, so all this stuff is going on in us. And what was most fascinating is it's going on in kids in a predictive way. There's this cool literature that you look at kids at age five or whatever, and kids who are already freaked out by novelty, freaked out by ambiguity, things of that sort, where something new is scary rather than exciting, that's a predictor of them 30 years later having much more socially conservative views about things. So that's incredible. This particular study, what they did was they sat down these kids, I think they were ages 5 to 13 or so, and they would show them pairs of faces once again, and they would say, okay, you're going on a wonderful voyage. You're on a voyage to Candyland or Narnia or wherever. And one of these two people could be the captain of your ship. Who do you want to be the captain? And 71% of the time, five-year-olds picked the individual of this pair who had won an election against the other one. Already at age five, People are not only picking up implicit cues, but are already making, who do I want to be the captain of my ship to, like, you know, Peter Pan's island or some such thing? It's already influencing decision making, which I think is, is beyond interesting and horrifying. And, oh, election season is just around the corner. And it translates pretty directly to the studies showing s discrepancies between people's conclusions of debates that were purely on the radio versus televised. I mean, it's that that's the grown up yes. version. I mean, famously Nixon versus Kennedy. Yep. Kennedy looked good on camera. Nixon needed a shave. Nixon sounded more, you know, presidential on the radio. There you have it. Yep. And that concludes episode 19. Uh, keep submitting your questions at the form found in the Instagram story highlight and bio or the YouTube video description. I'm Offspring Sher Sapolsky, and thanks for your continued support of Science and the Beard. <laughs>